Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. Um, we're really looking forward to our workshop today. I hope you are, too. We're going to learn a lot together. Um, I've got my whole group with me also. We're here to learn with you so we can help you going forward. Um, what we're going to do right now is have our provost just give us a good morning, and then we're going to jump right into the meetings. So, okay. Well, Raise your hand if you've actually, uh, I don't know, come for some sort of professional development or other reason to campus <laughs> before the semester starts. Uh, this is awesome. Some of you, I'm sure, have had some sort of administrative responsibility or, or teaching practice, whatever that might be. So anyway, welcome. We're excited that you're here. Um, you know, when we launched this project, uh, you know, this is brand new. Um, we didn't sort of know what would develop. Um, I can't tell you how exciting it is to see all of you in this room, and then we'll be meeting with the education uh, faculty this afternoon. Um, uh, so, so just as even a larger group of folks involved in this project. Now, maybe it's just me who really tuned into that stuff, uh, but uh, the nature of, of connections with different programs, um, how colleges, and we've thought of colleges for so long as sort of, you know, this is an experience that happens here, and it happens in a particular place with a label called William Patterson University. Um, well, just last week, uh, the state of, of, of all the state colleges in Pennsylvania have partnered with this company called Southern, this, this public university called Southern New Hampshire University uh, to, to deliver all their four-year degrees in, in these articulation agreements. I'm thinking, wow, but why would they do that in the state of Pennsylvania and potentially harm their other institutions? Um, or examples of, of uh, different two plus two agreements that are sort of popping up all around the state. And I guess the bottom line I would say is that you know, the way we think about college is becoming much more seamless. Students are coming in and going out. Um, but these sort of innovation leads to our future. Um, so as I've said before, you know, institutions build distinction in two ways. One through what you offer but also how you offer it. And this is actually a bit of both in there, but particularly on the, on the how we offer it in, the, in this, this particular process. So I'm excited about that. Um, on behalf of President Hal Dobler, who wouldn't be, couldn't join us this morning, he lost one of the green greetings, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, appreciate our, our partners and the partnership and the training you're going to be providing here momentarily. Um, you know, quality matters is an important part of, of what we're talking to do, and that we can hopefully scale this in other ways to and to make sure that we have the highest of quality in our, in our, in our programs, both online and in, in our face-to-face. -face. So that's, I guess, all I'll share right now before the scene more. And just real briefly over the weekend, I went to the American Dream Mall and went skiing. If you want to actually know what that's like, you can ask me. It was quite an experience with the two hours that we were there. <laughs> so my name is Kasha Fasti. I'm the Senior Director of Academic Services and Products Part of that. AP. I've been with AP for uh, almost four years now. Uh, my prior experiences with the uh, University of Minnesota, that's where my PhD is in curriculum and instruction. I have over like 22, 23 years of experience online uh, education, where it ranges from competency-based education to um, more like a uh, uh, outcome-driven curriculum. Uh, I've been uh, with AP and then I've been uh, very fortunate to work with your uh, leadership as well as some faculty as well all along the way uh, during this process um, as we are defining a little bit of more of uh, your your carousels and, and a program program uh, and four shells so having said that I will have introduced uh, let them introduce uh, uh, my colleagues here uh, Carrie you want to go next my name is Carrie Downing and I am the director of nursing and healthcare initiatives at academic partnerships and I've been with the company a um, couple of weeks longer than Kashif was, so four years. Um, and before that, I was an assistant dean at a large online university. I'm originally from Australia, then Canada, US. I got to do some research in Nigeria. So I've seen every kind of healthcare system there is out there. And I'm really excited to be working with you guys. I'm uh, Joe Gilry, instructional designer. Um, Unlike these guys from Texas, I'm based out of Florida, so um, a lot different weather up here, obviously. <laughs> um, been an instructional designer for going on 10 years now um, throughout the Florida State College system down there. Um, before that, I was a college football coach at the University of Toledo, so go Rockets. I don't know if anybody caught the game last night. So it's a good one. Um, but excited to work with y'all and uh, make sure your online courses are full of quality. Let's do it. Chris, you want to? Yeah, just uh, Chris Chid, I'm the Managing Director 
for academic mm -hmm. partnerships. Uh, excited to be working with you. We kick things off. Uh, can't believe it's September early, right, Jonathan? One of those uh, those uh, those early days, and, and Josh in our little small conference room. But uh, here we are, multiple workshops later, really getting into the meat of things, and we're excited uh, that you're all here with uh, the energy and the um, the attention that we're going to need for the next uh, next few hours. So glad to be here. <laughs> So in that packet here, the first uh, sheet on the packet is this uh, agenda um, or topic list for today. Just to uh, look at our two days uh, of uh, agenda real quick. Um, we have this morning, we have 8.30 to 4 uh, with, with this group. And then there is another session. There are some repeats for uh, college of education folks. If you want to come back, that's you're more than welcome to join as well for those sessions. Um, but uh, this morning we're starting with the with program. So right after this opening, um, uh, the uh, nursing team would go to another room uh, for the program specific meeting, just until 10 o'clock. And then there will be a break, and then we'll regroup in this room back here. Okay. So let's uh, uh, for the the next. Uh, like hour, almost like an hour, 15 minutes or so, we'll go over the program level uh, information. Uh, healthcare team uh, will be on, on, a, on a separate kind of room here, and then uh, business will stay here. Um, we'll have a break, and then we have our first session on cognitive load. Uh, and then uh, after that, we have credit hour and time and task. Um, then we have a lunch break from noon to one. We'll see if we can actually have uh, um, if we can have lunch over here, so we can actually show you some of the four shells that currently work on. Um, and then there is uh, next session is the best practices for accelerated online course design. Um, and then uh, the next section is uh, designing discussions. And then we'll wrap up for this more of this today's meeting. Um, after that, in the evening. We have 4.30 till 4.45, it will be a repeat for our education. So if you are interested in staying or kind of have part of the discussion, you can more than welcome to join. But that is for education of, of folks, uh, similar topics in this evening. Um, for tomorrow, we start again at 8.30 uh, until 3. And then we have session in the morning, a couple of sessions on assessment and uh, facilitation in online environment. Uh, we have a break and then we go to uh, creating videos, how to create videos and some best practices of videos. A lunch break and then we have some quality uh, and student experience, how the quality review is done and, and what are uh, quality matter in a little more detail. Uh, we have a break and then we have um, the last session is on uh, OER, Open Educational Resources. Uh, what are their different resources available? Uh, and then we wrap up. So just to help you, um, give you an overview of uh, what academic services um, uh, and we'll be uh, supporting you with your work. Um, it's, so it's, it's uh, helping actually our academic services and my, my team actually would be helping uh, you and your program leads uh, with uh, program planning, which we started uh, working on the carousel, for example, design and um, and, uh, and then the faculty workshop related information, uh, how the uh, the course shells, uh, what are the components of the courses, um, those kind of uh, information is kind of worked on early on. Um, we have then the course development phase, uh, where uh, where you are. The, the whole idea of this and the service we provide is to help and support where you are and where you want to go. And from our own experience, as well as from research-based uh, best practices, uh, we try to help actually and give you some ideas and, and brainstorm some ideas how to make uh, accelerated online uh, a quality uh, uh, program. Um, then we have a quality review process. If, if we each course development, once it's completed, there is an independent reviewer who is quality matter certified. They review the course for usability perspective. Uh, they're not going to provide you feedback on content. Again, the curriculum belongs to you, as well as uh, you decide on what changes to make in the curriculum. Um, 
uh, it's only provide the, the feedback from user experience perspective. Um, facilitation, that's also another area you'll hear from uh, some of the presenters today and tomorrow about um, some best practices of facilitation online courses. Um, and then we have a program evaluation, which is um, a year, year and a half from now, when we launch the program, um, you have actually an opportunity to look holistically on what has worked and what are the areas of opportunities to improve and uh, build on. Um, so that's, those are kind of services um, you provide uh, for, to help you. Um, and I'm going to skip on this one. And let me show you. Some of the, the areas you'll get some uh, help and support is in the course shell development uh, for consistent student experience. From when they move from one course to another course, they are actually experiencing their final information at the same place. Or, or your nomenclature for the courses that stays consistent. So those kind of uh, uh, help with that. Course orientation, that's Gammon uh, and your instructional design team at WP Online working together. And during lunch break, we'll try to see if we can have a demo of that, um, uh, uh, those uh, orientation. Uh, instructional technology guidance, instructional designer, Joe was here earlier, as you saw. Uh, he will be actually helping, as well as Gammon's instructional designers, uh, will be helping uh, you with providing with the, uh, what are the instructional technologies available and a uh, bounce of some ideas. Faculty e-commerce, that's a resource actually you'll have access to. It's a password protected uh, repository of lots of uh, best practices, guidance documents, some best practices. Uh, that's faculty e-commerce. Twice a year, we have a faculty grant uh, program. So you as a faculty can submit a proposal for a conference or you have a, some unique way you're presenting your course or designing your course. You can, uh, uh, we have already given almost $400,000 worth of uh, grant to faculty for the innovation, uh, so they can go. You can go and present at a conference, for example, and that covers like part the cost of your your uh, presentation. And uh, course component resources we also provide uh, some uh, like a PowerPoint if you want. Actually, you can create um, uh, uh, like a, a, a your branded uh, PowerPoint shell, so that. In each course, whenever faculty are providing information on PowerPoint, it has similar look and feel from the shell perspective. Uh, any question about this? I don't know if it's uh, now is a good question, but we have, uh, as some of us have already developed online, and we use publishers' packages. Yes. So what, do you have uh, agreement with these publishers? Can we use their PowerPoints in your, in your platform, or, or we should design them from scratch? Very good question. And um, those of you have um, um, online, I don't know if you heard the question. The question was about the publisher's content. Um, absolutely. You could continue to use as you have been using now. Um, okay. Yeah, but it's like uh, there are a couple ways to uh, build that kind of course. Uh, from user experience and consistent user experience, it's better actually you have your course shell that is used by other colleagues, other courses, use that, and then from each of those activities, link it out to publish your content. That's kind of our preferred and best practice, uh, but your instructional designer will work closely with you how to uh, design that. But it's, it's, yes. We already have our PowerPoint presentations already done. Yeah. We don't need to change them to match the shell of other courses, yeah. right? What I meant by um, over here with the PowerPoint shell, it's just if you want to brand. For example, you have an MBA. What program are you? Or uh, econ. Uh, the econ. 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 So if you want to actually have an econ or MBA, general MBA, uh, kind of uh, brand, you could actually put uh, a little icon, a, a logo, or some kind of like a color scheme, or just to give up. When students they see this, they know actually this is an MBA program at WP Online that I'm looking at this PowerPoint. So your content remains the same, but you can put that information in new new shell. If not, for first round, you don't have to change. Honestly, 
Uh, there, there are other things that are more important, to be honest with you, for first round. That's kind of a fine tuning down the road. So real quick about the process and program development process, and that is um, there is a six month process from like a kickoff to first start of the course. First four to six weeks, that's where the pro discovery and program planning is happening. Um, uh, I've been working with Rajiv, for example, uh, and uh, some other faculty to okay, develop this parasol, which we'll take a look at in a minute, minute here. Um, and that's the process. Today, actually, is a faculty workshop. This is one to do day workshop. That is a transition from the program planning phase into uh, course development. So that's where the 12 weeks are usually taken for a course to develop a course. Um, and you will have an instructional designer again helping you. Um, and then there's a four week window for uh, course quality review. Uh, that uh, independent reviewer would provide feedback to you and your instructional designer. And you, it's again, you take that feedback and then fine tune the course. And during this process of uh, course development, you have a faculty kickoff, which we'll see in the timeline real quick. Um, it's uh, two, in two weeks or so that fa uh, kickoff needs to happen. And then there's a first deliverable, there's a course map. Um, and, uh, and then there are a few other steps. Uh, you keep building incrementally and you get feedback from the instructional designer as well. Any question about this? And you all can read this, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is okay. Great, thank you. So based on the carousel we just looked at, um, I just we created this timeline uh, for the courses. So go live, if it's a summer one, go live. You need those four courses to be ready for students to go online. And column J, go live to students. That's a launch date. And from there, the course development, your instructional designer will contact you 16 weeks before that go live date. And if you go back to column D as in David, that's your faculty contact date. So it could happen. Joe, uh, the instructional designer, he's here, who will be working primarily with you. But you have Gammon's uh, team over here as well. They will shadow that process. So you have on-campus help as well as online through Joe from AP. Yes. If, if, if I could just you know, note that a, a decision was actually made you know, yesterday to um, delay the go live oh, okay. um, into the middle of the summer. That doesn't mean that we're not gonna start. Yes. <laughs> you know, right away to keep going. But everything would bump to few but, so but everything would- the middle of the summer? Everything would bump up. Like July, yeah, start July and, and it would actually be, I think, July 13th. It would July, be the, July 12th. the beginning date. So then each one would move down almost move a session down. plus a week. So, so the next one would be um, like August 31st or something. So our, our recommendation would be to continue with, if, if you want to delay it by like a week or two, that's fine. But continue this momentum as you are building. So you are ahead then. Yeah, I mean, part of the, part of the reason is it was a very tight schedule to begin with if we were going to make a go live in the middle of May. And it was also going to cut the marketing time down to maybe only 60 days instead of an ideal, which would have been about four months. Yeah. So um, we decided, you know, the, the cabinet members and so on worked together last night and decided along with academic partnerships folks that it would be best for us to get a stronger start if we if we delay. Sure. So, yes. But again, you know, I don't think it's advisable that we, you know, delay much on the course the development. development. Yeah. We yeah. want to get that started and use that delay in case we, you know, get delayed and, and things take it's, a little longer. Especially the first round, you're learning this kind of a new process, so to speak, as well. So any kinks in that you can address those. Do they have that fire? Yeah. No, no, not, not yet. Would you be 
kind enough to send it to us? So we can Ab absolutely. So, so that's based idea. on the parasol. Yeah, sure, sure. But maybe with the new dates. With the new dates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So if you can bear with me, um, I think we want to make sure that the previous document, the parasol, is finalized. Yeah. Yeah. Then you will have more accurate information because the courses may move sure. yes. on the carousel. Once that's done, yeah. I'll build this and then send it to Rajiv and he can share with you. Okay. And because the decision about the delay was just made yesterday last night, night. <laughs> um, yeah. and, no, and then the, the calendar of the start dates gets approved by cabinet tomorrow morning. Oh. Uh, so uh, oh. that way, yeah. those changes can be made and it can go out. Yes. Yeah. So, so. Uh, so you, once we have, uh, again, the updated carousel and it's created, so your faculty contact, they will contact you over here 16 weeks before it needs to go live, approximately. And then there is a course map. That's like a first deliverable. Um, course map, you probably have done it in one form or shape or even thought about it before. It's nothing new. Uh, what it is is a documentation of your course learning outcomes and how they align to different assessments, how you know if these students have achieved those, and then design your, what are the learning activities you're gonna be designing, module over module over module. So that is a, at a high level of blueprint, we call it, and we'll go over that in this afternoon session as well. Um, so that, that map is done, and then there's a first touch point, which is like after the map is done, then you start building it in, in your course shell. That's Blackboard course shell, and you start building. And we approximately say that, yeah, you do like 25% of the courses built at this first touch point. Uh, and then your instructional designer is there to review and help you with any question that you have or any help you need. Um, and that's done. Then there's a couple other touch points. And the third touch point is when you are 100% done, you have built the course. And then again, your instructional designer is not only giving you feedback at these touch points, they are available for you to, if you are trying to kind of create an activity and you need to brainstorm some ideas, what technology is out there. You can email instructor designer and set up a time uh, for a Zoom meeting and then brainstorm with them uh, in between these dates. Uh, once the course is completed, then we have this four week window for the review. So this course goes to another person who has never seen this course before and they give like in a week or so, they give you and your instructional designer feedback on your course. And again, the focus of their course, their feedback is not on the content. It's only on the usability, which means that if there are any instructions which are a little confusing or no instructions sometimes, um, they will provide that feedback to you uh, to add this, clarify this, those kind of things. So a rubric actually is okay, yeah, it's not adding up, for example, or some those kind of feedback. And then you get back, you have about two to three weeks to refine, take that feedback, refine it, so that course is ready to go live. So now we're going to talk a little bit about cognitive load, the credit hour, and time on task. So before I get started, I'd like to ask people, so what do you know about cognitive load? I have cognitive overload right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we <laughs> That is probably one of the more common statements I get. I think I'm in overload, or I know when I'm in overload, but that's about it. All right. I always like to ask, uh, double check what people are aware of. So when we are working with students and when we're developing a course, we want to make sure that learning is manageable. So really, we're looking at a couple of different things. One is we want to consider how learning occurs, how we can help students retain information, because it's wonderful that they came to our class, but if they don't leave with something, then it probably wasn't as useful as we would have hoped. We need to make sure we're keeping a, a mind on the credit hours, so how many hours can we even put in our class. And then for this third one, we want to double check how long it should take to do different things. So really, it's how we learn, how things are retained, what are our credits, and therefore how many hours can we have in the class and then so if I know how many hours are in the class I need to then determine what each task is so that then that'll add up to those hours. Alright so the first one cognitive load. 
So with information processing, and you're going to have a couple of handouts for this session in your package. This first one is managing cognitive load. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then the credit hour worksheet. And then a time on task worksheet. Did you take that from my Uh, we also have the types of tasks and assignments. <laughs> Managing cognitive load, one of them. Next one, credit hour worksheet. Having to pull them out now so that that way when we get to them, you will have them ready. Excuse me. Yes. Could you give a copy of these documents to Dr. Shikari? Yes, all of these will be provided to you. Yeah. <coughs> uh, the next one here is kind of been folded the wrong way around, but it's the time on task worksheet. Then types of tasks and assignments. Alrighty. So first we're just going to start with a little bit on the information processing model. So when information comes in, first place it goes to is your sensory memory. So think of this as um, you've heard the music in an elevator, right? You, as long as your, your senses are not otherwise damaged, that information is going to come in. It's going to register in your sensory memory. <coughs> what do you think happens if you don't pay attention to it? Mm -hmm. You're going to no. forget, right? It's you just going to be remember. forgotten. Exactly. It's going to be forgotten. So you're not going to remember it. Makes sense, right? I'm pretty sure that most of you probably can't recite to me the various different uh, elevator musics you've heard in your lifetime, right? Oh, yeah. Next step. Uh, if we do pay attention to it, we're going to go into working memory. So how long does working memory last for? <laughs> pretty close. It's 30 seconds for most people, so it's pretty short. Not one semester, no. Uh, it is pretty short. Uh, the thing you need to think about when you do have the working memory piece is have you ever heard it, you can only kind of maintain in your mind so many numbers at a time? So that's, that's kind of why some people say, no, no, my, my working memory is really long. And I said, okay, recite pi to a thousand decimals. They're like, no, no they, they can't do that. So it really only sticks for so long. Think about any uh, phone numbers, right? Everyone's got them in their phone nowadays. We don't actually have to memorize them. But your phone numbers are usually, again, those, those uh, slightly longer numbers. And we've got to say it again and again. But if we don't pay attention to, again, that information coming in, what happens? Yeah. We forget again. Have you ever driven home and you remember leaving? <laughs> you remember getting home. <laughs> You're not dead, so you something didn't happen in the middle. We're going to make an assumption that aliens did not abduct you and then put you in your new place, so you actually drove. This is the kind of thing. You're not paying attention to it. It's obviously going in your sensory memory. You're doing something with it, but you just aren't. You're not retaining it, and then all of a sudden you are home. Uh, but you are working usually then on you know, autopilot. So what we want to do is repeat and rehearse in order to keep and maintain some of that information. So what do you do if you get a phone number that you can't just write down? You have to say it to yourself over and over and over again, right? You're sitting there uh, reciting that. However, that in and of itself is not the only thing we need to do. So, what does practice make? Perfect. So that the adage is uh, that practice makes perfect. That's actually not quite true, is it? When you think about it. No. What does practice make? Practice makes permanent. If you don't practice the right thing, you're going to be permanently doing the wrong thing. So, let's just say. Um, 
I practiced, uh, let's say for nursing, I'm giving an injection. And I keep practicing that on my orange or my little gel pad, and I keep practicing it away. But I'm doing it completely wrong. If I practice it, I will become very good at doing it wrong. So what we need in here as well, in addition to the rehearsal, is feedback. So this is one reason why if students never read their feedback, they keep doing the same thing wrong, right? Because you can, they're gonna keep doing the same thing the way they were doing it. You know, they're writing their papers the exact same way, unless they get feedback and read it. Um, they're never going to make that change. <clears throat> so we wanna, in terms of helping students learn, we wanna make sure that they're encoding information into memory. <clears throat> Why do you think it's hard for us to remember pi out to like you know, 20 digits? Why do you think that's hard? Because it's not important. It's not important. <coughs> it's irrelevant. And numbers are still sort of abstract. There's nothing that makes you necessarily remember those numbers in that order. However, people, and I, I remember hearing some statistic, like there's only five people in the world who can remember pi out to some really high level of numbers. And again, they use tricks. So have you ever seen anyone who's in one of those memory competitions and things like that, where they can remember crazy numbers, and they can remember things. And it's usually because they make a story out of it. So they'll turn these numbers into their own little story. Uh, yep, yeah, or images, that kind of thing. So we are hardwired to remember certain things in certain ways. We remember stories. If you think about it, all throughout history, every religious text, all of these things, they're all written in stories. We don't just remember, don't do this. We remember, this was the situation, and this is what happened. You know, those kind of things. Your mom didn't tell you to not frown. She said, if you do that, your face will stick that way. It was the story that helped you remember that. So one thing we want to do is help people attach new information to existing memory. How do you do that? Well, in discussion questions, for example, I can ask students, now you've got this information, give me a time in your past how you could use this information now and make a different decision, or give me a situation when, those kind of things. So again, people are situationally speaking, tell a story. In addition, uh, this is an opportunity for us to share our stories. You almost certainly do it right now in your face-to-face -face classes. It probably just occurs more naturally. You just start talking about something and the story comes out. We have to be just a little bit more deliberate about it when we're doing online. We need to make sure that we continue to still add our stories in. And unfortunately, what I see a lot of the time is that's one of the first things people sort of cut out and don't do anymore, is the stories. So you can imagine in, for example, so I'm a nurse in some of my nursing community classes, I would give stories or examples of how situations occurred and why this was important or why that was important. That's gonna stick a little bit more. So now I'll do a little lecture and I'll just have that experience in there so that that way they still get that context, really. Because if you read a textbook, a lot of the time it lacks context. It lacks the story. It, it doesn't lead <coughs> itself to retention particularly well. So what we're doing is also translating what's in the book into real life and helping students retain that information. So we want to encode it using things like stories, using things like existing memory. We want to help people retain that information. Why? Because we're going to hope that it sticks and that one day you'll know how to retrieve this. So that later when you're sitting there at work and your boss says make a budget, you don't stand there, you know, with a blank face going, budget? I don't remember budgets. <laughs> we also then need them to retrieve that information. So again, connecting things to context is more likely to retrieve it because you remember that context as well. So again, that's how some of those memory people can sit there, rememorize all those numbers, and then say them back to you as well. So memory, memorizing something is only as good as being able to retrieve it later. So again, we want to contextualize things. All right, so this is exactly where work, where cognitive load is really managed in there. 
And what we're doing here is when we're trying to move things from working memory to long-term memory, we've got to manage that. We've got to help students to retain that information and learn. So this is your sheet here. We're going to talk through some of these um, different types of processing pieces and what we can do to help students. So it's not all bad. There are things we can do to help students. Now, again, at the end of the day, people will do or not do what they want to do, but we can certainly enhance or facilitate this experience. So one of the first things we want to do is help reduce extraneous processing. So what does this mean to you? Yes, all the useless stuff, right? Anything that's distracting. So when we're talking about a face-to-face -face class, it would, a lot of the time there's our environment, right? And we consider our environment. Is it too hot? Is it too cold? Is it too bright? Is there somebody standing in the corner doing a little dance? If Cassius was over there dancing in the corner, that might be very distracting to you. Um, we want to make sure that, uh, believe it or not, even the colors of your walls can actually make a fairly significant difference. You know, if you paint your kitchen blue, you eat less. Which I'm fairly convinced most people who I tell that to go home and paint their kitchen blue. So, but it's the truth that a lot of uh, a lot of these things in our environment have a remarkable effect on the information we retain and what we do with things. I remind students that in their um, even when they're doing online stuff, they need to set up a really good station where they can work. Although all of the commercials always seem to imply that you can do everything all at once, right? Like they said to my nursing group, you can be a mom, you can go to school full time, you can do aerial acrobatics, and you can work full time, and you're like, probably not all at once, and probably not quite that likely, but unless you just don't sleep anymore, in which case your cognitive processing is going to slow down too. But as you can imagine, sitting at like a table with the kids screaming in the background, the TV on, somebody saying, hey mom, where's dinner? Or hey dad, you know, do something. That's not going to help you very much when you're trying to study. So you do need a spot where you can set aside those things where things can be quiet and that you reduce the distractions and that kind of thing. And support your learning how you see fit. But again, setting things up, even and the sound of cars going by can actually be distracting. Uh, we'll talk about video processing later, but it, some of these things are very true when you're creating a video as well. As you can imagine, if you had a video and there's something over here dancing in the corner, that's going to be distracting. So we don't want that for our students because they're going to watch that thing. Do you remember Clip It? The little paper clip that used to pop up all the time? Hey, can I help you? Go away. Go away. He was distracting. He's gone away now for that reason. In addition to um, the physical environment, we also want to make sure that our electronic environment is set up in such a way that we reduce a lot of that extraneous processing. So we are going to talk to you guys, and later on we're going to show you a common course shell. And this is not designed to... Uh, take away any freedoms or anything like that. What it's designed to do is give consistency from course to course. What we want our students to do is complete the assignment, not spend two hours trying to find the assignment. Right? So if the assignment is in the same place in every course, I no longer have to worry about that. So it's have some consistency and those kind of things as to where stuff is, how you move from place to place, that kind of stuff. And that's very advantageous for the student. You decrease the amount of cognitive load. They're burning up on something that is completely irrelevant when you think about it. We also want to make sure we keep in mind certain colors as well. So you want to have that sharp contrast. Has anyone seen it where someone's put like yellow on blue? It's very hard to read. And that will be very distracting to you. So that's good not only for cognitive value reasons, but it's also required for your ADA purposes as well, because somebody with any kind of visual processing issues is going to have a hard time with those lack of contrast. You've probably seen slides that are huge, like they've got 12 point font from top to bottom of information. Problem with that is 
it's not something people can read, and then they're not listening to you at the same time. They're doing one or the other, and they're not getting the point of either because they're splitting their, their concentration. So what you really want to do is make sure that the slide is supporting what you're saying, but not be what you're saying. So that's why it's good to do voiceover PowerPoints and have a minimal on there so it supports what you're saying as opposed to being it. You also don't want to have like crazy distracting stuff. So we've seen PowerPoints where every single one of those letters up there are managing cognitive flow was a different color. It is remarkably irritating to the eye. And you, you will sit there and you will look at it for a while instead of paying attention to what's on the slide. Animations, anything that's sort of distracting, try to keep to a minimum unless it's absolutely necessary. So if you're demonstrating a process, you may need an animation, but don't have animations just for the sake of animations. Make sense? Any questions? All right, next one, support germane processing or focus. What do you think this means? Well, let me ask you this. If I were to give you a textbook, which these days, you know, half of them are 200 and something word pages, I mean, uh, each. And let's say I was going to give it to you on something you don't know a lot about. Let's just say aliens. We'll go with aliens. And you were to read through that textbook. How would you know which information is really important versus which information is less important? Or even to the point of superfluous. An assignment. I like it. Focus in on. Yeah, there's an assignment. Highlight like the section. Pardon? Highlight the section. Highlight sections, yeah. Yes. Could they be in a box? Like sometimes they are like important things to know in a box. Yeah. At the same time, at the end of the chapter, there's a summary. Sometimes, yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Assuming that those are the same important things to you. Sometimes the textbook may or may not have the same things quite. The basic idea of when you first started reviewing this content, right, as a student, you don't know which is more important than which other. And the reality is, is not every single word in every single textbook is created equal, right? You would probably want students to learn, remember, retain certain parts of that textbook more than other parts, right? There are some bits that are just more important. You know, for example, let's say I'm teaching a patho course. I want you to remember heart failure. That is super important. There's a, it's a big disease. A lot of people affected by it. But maybe the a disease that affects 0.001% of the population, we're gonna spend less time on that, if at all, because you can't necessarily fit everything in every class. And therein lies part of the piece for faculty. We need to determine what is nice to know and what is need to know. If you walk out of my class and you know nothing else, I want you to make sure you know this. Because everybody in this room could take the class that they have now or teach now and teach a whole program on just that topic. It, there is so much information out there these days on every topic, it is almost impossible to just, uh, to, to say you can teach everything in it. It's, it's, not really possible. Instead, we have to make a judgment call as faculty as to what we're going to put in that class. Now, there are some parameters on that. You know, you've got program maps, you've got industry standards, you've got accreditation standards, all those kinds of things that are going to help narrow you in as to what you need to cover. But there's still going to be a judgment call in there. And that's what we're doing, is we're helping the students focus. We're making them look at this textbook in a different light, of not just here, read this, memorize it, which we know is not going to happen, but help them focus in and pick out the important information and retain it. Hopefully all our students can read. But can they really read this book the way you want them to read the book? Can they learn the way you want them to learn? And if you don't point out what is more important, maybe read these pages out of this chapter versus these ones. Uh, maybe it's not the whole chapter, maybe it's a couple of pages, certainly not the whole book if it's a really big one. You know, so there can be bits and pieces where we can help them focus. Another way you can help people focus is to 
give them questions to uh, answer. So even though this might not be the assignment itself, every time I have a reading or a video or a lecture, or even if I send them out to a website, I would give them things to think about, look for, and answer. So it might be a statement. This is a little bit about this. I want you to look for this thing in there. It might be a question or a series of questions. What did you do here? How did this person do this? What about this particular condition? Those kind of things. So I'm helping them to read through it. Now, I'm not expecting them to sit down and write this out in a full sentence, but I'm giving them a tool in order to focus in on that content to pull out the bits that I want them to remember. I've also given students um, organizers. So uh, I was teaching a pharmacology class, and students were like, OK, I I'm not remembering this stuff. How can we do it? Well, we brought it back to a higher level. So you have in pharmacology prefixes and suffixes, which help you identify what class of drugs it is. So I don't need to remember every single little drug. Remembering the big class is a big first step. So uh, that can help. But then also, if you, if you know anything about drug trials, you'll know that uh, if anyone had a side effect, it's going to show up on that side effect list. It may or may not necessarily have related to that drug. So uh, I, will, uh, I will have students memorize or remember the most common and the most significant ones, side effects. So have you ever watched, I'm sure you have, uh, one of those commercials on TV about drugs, right? <coughs> Side effects are nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, constipation. Always tuberculosis. Yeah. Always <laughs> tuberculosis. It's like or death. everything that goes. <laughs> so as you can imagine, the, the really important stuff, it's kind of missed in the, in the mush of those thousand things that could go wrong. But what I want you to really understand is the most common, and the most significant. And I can give you an example of this. I uh, had surgery not too long ago, and I was given, I am very tolerant to, to pain medication for my pain, and they kept giving me more pain medication, like uh, probably a narcotic like morphine, and I kept stopping breathing. That's a significant side effect of this drug. Like, I really want you to know that. Instead of actually reversing that effect with another drug, they sat my husband next to me and told him to make sure I breathe. And so, yeah. And don't fall asleep. Yeah. And then they went on lunch. And after, after telling him how to shut off the O2 sat on him too, I said to him, it's a really good thing you liked me. You could have offed me, right? Um, but you can see how I wanted yeah. Was this in Texas? Yes. Yeah. Was it a Where did you go? <laughs> oh, it's really sad because I went to a Baylor in it. Wow. Yeah. Oh. But this was like right before Christmas, and I think I got the, the D shift or something like that. Like everyone that was decent was off or something. But, but as you can imagine, this is a fairly significant sort of example of I want you to know the really significant side effect. I want you to know if you give too much narcotic, the person can stop breathing. That's a pretty big deal. So if I get nausea or constipation from this, this is a little bit lower down on the list of things that I want you to remember. But I also do want you to know a couple of other ones. You know, things like you're going to get drowsy, you're going to get sleepy, don't drive, those kind of things. So helping the students sort of pick out some of those pieces was very important. Helping them know what to write down on their list of things. I'm very big on, remember the pharmacokinetics of it, how does it work? If you remember how it works, you're going to know some of the side effects. Just because if it decreases this system, you're going to get drowsy. That's just how that system works. So helping them understand some of the root of it. That's what focus. That's what we're there to help them with. And textbooks frequently do a lousy job of it. They give the facts, and they leave it to us to then help put those facts together. So if all you had is your textbook, as you can think, it doesn't necessarily link everything together. It doesn't give you context. It doesn't help you understand why I should care about this. Our final one is reducing intrinsic processing. This is the difficulty. Has anyone here ever had to read a very complex theory? 
Probably, right? Anyone who's done their doctoral work has had to read a thousand of them, and you may or may not like them. I remember reading through one. It's uh, Patterson and Zarat's Humanistic Phenomenology, and I'm fairly convinced that even though I was reading English, that it was a different language, because I had to have a um, dictionary and then a couple of books on existentialism sitting next to me in order to translate this thing over time, because it was so hard to read. So first time through it, I couldn't figure out what they were saying. And that's true of a lot of things, right? When it's a complex, difficult thing to learn, first time through, you're probably not going to figure it out. So what can we do to help? I can't make that theory any less difficult. It is, it is difficult. But what I can do is help stagger that information, right? And we do this intrinsically with other things. You take class A before class B because you needed to know class A information before you could know class B information. So we're doing this at a program level already. We just don't always do it at a course level. Sometimes at a course level, that big, tough theory may be at the last piece, but we didn't break it down all the way through. So consider breaking things down. So it would have been helpful, for example, if they taught me existentialism before I learned this big theory. So that way it would make sense. So breaking those bits and pieces down. And it can occur across different courses. So I am not going to do with well with pharmacology if I don't know patho first. And before that, I even need to know anatomy and physiology. You know, so it can occur across courses. I need to know what your body is and what it does, then what's going wrong, then I can help you fix it. But if it doesn't occur in that order, it sort of doesn't make sense anymore. I try to fix something I don't even understand. So the same thing, if you have a larger, uh, complicated kind of information, help students scaffold that information. It could be in assignments. You know, you have a little bit of an assignment here, then you move into a little bit of the assignment here, then so on and so forth. One reason why I love scaffolding assignments from week to week is because I like to force them to read my feedback. How many students have you had that didn't read your feedback? I'm fairly convinced everybody has seen it and it has frustrated you beyond belief because you've spent the time putting that feedback in there and they should have read it. I've said to students, you know what? I don't know if someone else taught you this before. So I'm maybe a little bit more lenient the first time I see mistakes. But the second, third, etc., I'm going to get harder and harder and harder every time I grade you because you are not learning in my class then. You are not taking the feedback, you are not interpreting it, and you are not integrating it. I had one example where a student was, uh, didn't do so well in week one, didn't do so well in week two. Week three, she suddenly did a lot better, and I said, what changed? And she said, I read your feedback. <laughs> So, you know, again, by scaffolding that, I can also help clarify when it's a difficult concept if you're not getting it. I can help put in some of that feedback and say, okay, you're not quite understanding it, here's this piece. Again, we frequently do this ahead of time with some ideas, just don't always with all ideas. So, so keep in mind. Well, here are some uh, other examples, if you wanted to write any of them. We'll give you these PowerPoints afterwards, but um, here, uh, uniform design, again, explicit instructions. Uh, and I also encourage you, let's just say you wanted students to have a great deal of creativity, so you didn't have a rule as to where things should fit, you know. We usually, our, our rules are our boundaries, you can do whatever in here. But if you're open and you're like, Knock yourself out. Give me something awesome. I did that with a really good um, kind of more art project with students in a nursing class. And I was like, nope, you've got freedom. Tell them that. Because a, a, an instruction that just leaves it vague and open is scary. And you are going to spend way more mental time fussing about what you should do instead of actually doing it. Worst assignment question, worst assignment instructions I ever saw were, what is your philosophy on learning? So in this particular circumstance, when they said, what is your philosophy on education? I'm like, so I could answer, good, it's good, I like it, it's outstanding. There was not a really in-depth understanding of what they were looking for. Which again, I said to the faculty member, 
if you want this open, just tell them. I have no expectations, or this is an open question deliberately, you know, be creative, that kind of thing, then that's fine. Just tell the student that. If otherwise, you're going to want to have some details. And in this circumstance, I know that the faculty member had very specific requirements because you saw the complaints the next week when all the students failed the assignment. And so, if you have specific expectations, then you do want to provide those specific expectations to the students. So you're not you're not giving them the answers. You're not telling them what to do. You're just being detailed on what you are looking for. There we go. Again, focus on what is most essential and important to the outcomes. You can't cover everything. And I'm always having to remind people you just you can't. It's not possible. You're not going to remember it either as a student. So focus on what you really need them to focus on. It's actually said that you will remember less than 5% of what is just lectured at you. So it's just not the way to go, right? We want students to do. I uh, had taught a patho class and had had the students present to each other on different topics. Inevitably, whichever topic the student presented on, they did phenomenally well in that section on the tests, always. And, and that's because, again, you remember a lot more of what you have to teach, in part because you don't want to look like an idiot. Never underestimate the effect of peer pressure. Students will re-video uh, themselves uh, 10, 12 times just so that they feel like they look better doing it. But what are they inadvertently doing when they're doing that? They're learning. Um, support domain processing, again, um, supporting the or organization of the essential information like we talked about. Um, you want to use a warm tone. And then the reducing intrinsic processing. Uh, worked and faded examples are really useful. Um, that's a I do, we do, you do kind of scenario. I think of it a lot in math. Um, so I had a student who was struggling with a basic calculation in a pharmacology class. So even those of you who aren't in healthcare are going to accept this. So if the doctor orders 200, uh, 500 milligrams of Cipro and you have 250 milligram tabs, how many tabs do you have to give? <laughs> Not complicated, right? She couldn't get it. And she's sitting there saying to me, I don't understand. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm a higher ed teacher. I don't know how to teach basic math. And one plus one is two. You're just going to have to believe me on that. Um, she wasn't getting it until we sat there on the board and I wrote it out and I did the calculation. Then I sat with her and we did another version and then I had her do it. That act of actually doing it and seeing me actually write it out and actually do the calculation was what she needed. And that's a worked or faded example. Um, I think in a lot of scenarios, we tend to do this whenever we're teaching very tactile skills. Like you think about if I'm teaching you um, how to do a bed bath, I'm probably going to do it. Then I have us kind of, I might correct you kind of thing, and then I have you do it. So any type tactile skill, that's usually how we teach things. I do, we do, you do, or I correct you in the middle one. But we often forget about it when it comes to more strictly academic kind of ideas. But it is a very useful one, especially if students are struggling, because essentially what you're helping them with is the process of the learning. And they may not be getting the process. What are you doing in what order? Because the book has it already done, right? It doesn't have this bit pop up, then this bit pop up, then this bit pop up. So you help with process a lot. Again, we talked about sequence, pace, processes, and then introducing key concepts. Questions? Now that I've thoroughly overloaded you, you can all recite to me cognitive load, right? This also has to be a little flexible, depending on where the student is. And this is on the other side of that sheet for novice to expert. When you're a novice, you don't know what you don't know, right? This is where multimedia can be very useful. Structure, structure, structure. You do not send a novice out to do things the first time on their own saying, good luck to you, I hope you survive. We want to be more structured, we have more guidance, that kind of thing. 
uh, demonstrations, worked examples. This is where checklists are very useful. Again, you haven't reached the point where you kind of know what steps you're supposed to do. This is where I tell students, I'm not giving you quick fixes or shortcuts. I need you to learn it this way first. Over time, you'll find shortcuts your own way, but I need you to know it from start to finish. Think of a musician, right? They had to learn all of the bits first before they could start doing something cool and creative. But if you don't know your basics, you don't know how to read music, you don't know how to play your instrument in the most basic way, you're not going to be able to do something cool or creative. It's going to sound weird. So you need to learn your basics first, and this is how you kind of learn your basics. However, as you can imagine, as you get further <coughs> along in your education, you want to do more in different things. If you're still giving people checklists in a final class, that could be a problem. Right? They, they want to do things more interestingly. Uh, same thing as you're moving in terms of up in programs. You know, your undergrad, your grad, your doctoral. When I first started my doctoral journey, um, I started in an EDD because I do a lot of education. But they wanted me in my first true EDD class, after some of the leadership ones, etc., to be working on No Child Left Behind and some of those things. And I'm like, but that's not the population I'm interested in. I want to work with adults. Um, I work with nurses mainly, but I want to work with adults at the very least. And they're like, nope. So I left that program. Because if the process wasn't there for me, you know, you want to be able to make your learning meaningful to you. And I couldn't believe it. The program director said to me, just get the paper and then you can do what you want. And I said, I'm not spending four plus years doing this if I don't enjoy it. So there's a certain amount of control you want over your learning at a certain point. So if I have a discussion question, there's true. There's going to be some pieces you just have to learn. If you don't like budgeting and you're in an MBA, too bad, you're just going to have to learn budgeting. Muscle through it and we're going to move on to the next piece. But there could be opportunities as you're moving along. So instead of forcing everyone to build a certain kind of business, you let people choose. Think of what kind of business you would like to create and make your plan based on that. Or think of a healthcare scenario you're in or Make it based on something you're interested in as opposed to you have to do it in orthopedics. You know, that kind of thing. So this is where you can still give people choice, but stick within what you need them to learn. All right, so that's cognitive load. Now that we're thoroughly overloaded, we'll move on to our next piece. The next one is the credit hour. What do you guys know about the credit hour? You're mumbling. Yes. 50 minutes is one hour. 50 minutes is an hour? Whatever it is, it's times three. Yeah, that's where you're number credits. Okay, so we'll, we'll go through this then. And you do have a sheet that's going to basically explain this um, to help you out uh, long term. So, according to the government, the federal credit hour is, and you have the actual statement in here if you ever, you know, are bored and want to read it. And uh, it is basically a unit of measure. It is not infallible. Uh, a lot of people have argued it's sometimes not the best measure. But at the moment, it's sort of one of the only measures we have. You know, there's either this or we're talking more concept or uh, CBE uh, kind of measure. So this is one of the one of the very few ways you can actually measure. Um, it is associated with the quantity of student work, not the quality. Please note that. It is amount. Uh, and it is uh, associated <coughs> with financial aid. So if we don't adhere to this as faculty, the school in general could lose its ability to grant financial aid. Um, and it gives value to the amount of time. All right, so short and sweet. It is one hour of classroom or direct faculty instruction per week for 15 weeks, and two hours of out of class or student instruction or work per week for approximately 15 weeks. So that's this, one credit is one to two for 15 weeks, which is 15 to 30, which is 45. <coughs> so every one credit 
is 45 hours worth of work. Doesn't matter if you're face-to-face -face or online, it's 45 hours worth of work. So as you can imagine, the number of hours of student work per week is then gonna be the number of credits by 45. So most people's classes are how many credits? Three. Three, three is an average, three is a normal, three is because all of our financial aid things are always in quantities of three. So you get part-time financial aid usually in a semester. If you have six credits, you get full-time if you have 12 credits. It varies if, at the graduate level, but basically a lot of things are in, in quantities of three. It seems to be the magic number. And then if you want to know how many uh, hours per week, so in a three-credit course, three times 45 is 135. So it's 135 hours worth of work in your three credit class. Now if you want to know roughly how many hours a week that is, you just divide it by the number of weeks. So divided by seven, that's a little over 19 hours a week. It's 19.2 hours per week that the students need to be working. I always tell students it will take you at least 20 hours. Anyone have a wild guess as to why I say that? I usually say to students, it will take you at least 20 hours a week. Distractions? Yeah, because at least then they might spend it closer. Because if I say, the truth is that's supposed to be on average. Who thinks they're average? <coughs> hey, nobody thinks they're average. In fact, only people who are clinically depressed tend to accurately say how long it will take them to do something. It's quite ridiculous how much people overestimate their ability to do some of these things. They think, oh, it'll take me four hours on a Sunday night, and I'll have it all. And you're like, no, 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 no. That's Most people uh, think highly of themselves. Say again? Yeah. Most people think highly of themselves. They do. And, you know, we don't want to make them clinically depressed, so we, we <laughs> want to. Go right along with it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Exactly. We, we want to keep their, their self-esteem uh, decently high. But by saying something like it will take you at least, there's a slightly greater chance that people are going to spend closer to the amount of time. Do students always spend how many hours a week? Probably not. Yeah. I'm going to say honestly. But at least that way I'm, I'm sort of setting the expectation closer to what they might do. So it was interesting when I was at a board of nursing meeting at, for deeds and directors in Arizona, the head of the board had decided to do an example with us to sort of prove this point. And she said, okay, if I play 20 one-hit wonders, how many do you think you could get, a, from the 80s, how many do you think you can get right? And we'd have to write down a number. Then she played these 20 one-hit wonders, and then we answered the questions, and then we found out well, how many we got right. How do you think people thought they were going to do it before, and how well did they actually do? They thought they were going to do a lot better than what they actually did. And it's just generally true across the board. I also remind people that um, you know you. You know that there are some things you do better than other things. And there are some things you struggle at. If English is your second language, then maybe reading's not your forte. Then maybe you need to spend a little bit of extra time doing that. If you struggle with math questions in my research class, then maybe you need to spend a little more time on that. So that way, you know, maybe you're spending a bit more time on that, a little less on something else, but at least, again, I'm encouraging you to, but not everyone's gonna be equal, and you might need to spend some more time on the things that you're not doing as well on. Now, uh, sometimes people will say to me, that means I'm cramming too much into my seven-week class. Not necessarily true. Um, what we need to consider is that more often than not, do you think people are, have, we're going to do the Goldilocks thing, do people have too little, too much, or just right in their class based on their credits? Too much. Too much. Too much. Almost universally. So look at your class, and that's where we're going to look at time on task next, and truly evaluate whether you think you have too much, too little, or just right. Now, things can move a little bit. Don't get me wrong, having too little is actually a bigger problem than having too much for accreditation purposes. And having too much faculty directed versus student directed is also more problematic. So what you want to do is have the students do more than you just tell them. It's more faculty directed when you're just telling them. It's 
or student directed when they're actually doing something. And you can turn something that was very faculty directed into something that's very student directed by having like quizzes and you can turn a PowerPoint and have little pop-ups do this quiz before you can move on to the next one. So that becomes more interactive. Even having a video and asking questions, you know, becomes a little bit more interactive. So have people do more than just passive learning. And that's really what they want. They want you to, you're gonna remember more when you do something. And we want them to remember more, so have them do more. What happens a lot of the time is again, people start out with way more in their class. I have one faculty member, by her own volition, she had 35 hours a week of reading alone. The whole class wasn't supposed to be more than 20 hours a week, and she had 35 hours of just reading. How many students do you think actually did that reading? A whopping none. And we know this because we actually surveyed some of them afterwards, and they even said they don't do that reading. They look at the assignment and they go backwards and read only that which they think is important for the assignment. People will make judgment calls. And keep that in mind. They will make a judgment call. Are all things created equal? Probably not. So there's probably a reading, a video, a journal article, a website. Something in your class is probably more important than something else. If you leave the judgment call up to them, they may not read it. They may not look at it. They may not uh, work with it. Uh, all things created equal, if you had three articles in your class, uh, now if you had 15, they're probably going to open that up, look at it, and say, I'm not doing any of them. When it looks overwhelming, they just say, eh, done. Now let's just say we dropped it down and we had only a few. You're far more likely to at least do one or two of them. Which ones are they going to pick if they have an option? The shortest. The shortest. <laughs> but is the shortest the best? Maybe it's not. Maybe you want them to read the 20 page article and you just have that as the thing to read. And then you could put some other stuff in a nice to know section. I'm not suggesting you have to get rid of everything, but you can. Now there's seminal works that are going to be older, but the other thing that we did, uh, what I did with this faculty member is she had a lot of stuff in there that was just old. It wasn't seminal, it was just old and it needed to be removed anyway because what happens is we do this a lot of the time you go to a conference you read an article you do something but if we keep putting in how frequently do you take the stuff out when you keep putting in so your class that was reasonable when you taught students 10 years ago in the same class is now this full because we just we keep putting in you rarely take out and trust me i'm i'm just as much a uh, guilty of this as anyone else, I have to go back over my classes because I've convinced I have enough work to teach three classes of anything. Uh, and it's good to have some prep stuff. Students might ask you questions that you're just not, uh, that's not within the normal scope of the class, so you can answer questions for sure. But really taking a look at how much stuff is in your class. Is this doable? Is this reasonable? Now if your answer to that is yes, so be it. If this is absolutely necessary, that you have this in this class, then that is absolutely necessary. But it's just a, a, an idea of taking a look. And sometimes the thing that we got married to a long time ago, like again, same faculty member really loved this one assignment she did where she actually had students go to the state capitol and watch, watch the um, state representatives. And they said, that's nice, but most people in an online environment don't live next to their state capitol. <laughs> really want them to be driving that far? She's like, I didn't think of that. In addition, because the program had morphed over time, that same assignment was now in another class. So they did it twice. Because <laughs> she really liked the assignment, she originally created it, but because objectives moved to another class when they realigned things, someone else also liked that assignment, they put it in there. I mean, word for word, these assignments were the same. So keep that in mind as well. It, it doesn't belong in your class is the other thing. Sometimes when we don't have perspective of where students are doing things in a program, we may feel, I've got to cover this because I don't know if you're going to get it somewhere else. So also talk with your fellow faculty to see whether or not it's being covered somewhere else. And needless to say, if I'm teaching a patho course and I think 
Well, if students don't know anatomy and physiology, they can't understand patho. If I go and try to teach you anatomy, physiology, and patho, I'm not fitting that in, in a seven-week class, guaranteed. So I need to rely on certain other information. There can be things where you say, look, if you don't remember this, here's a good site to go look at it. So I'll send students like Khan Academy. If you don't remember the anatomy of the liver, then I need to send you somewhere so you can. That's not part of my regular piece. That's on you. So just keep that one in mind. Are people covering it somewhere else as well? All right. Next one is time on task. So the logical question after, um, after thinking about how much can be in your class overall is, well, I need to figure out how to add up to the 135 hours. So how long does it take to do each thing so I know how many things I can put in my class, right? If it took you 35 hours to read one article, then I could only put one in there. Again, on average, so we're not we're not going wild. Oh, one other thing I just wanted to say about uh, the amount of hours per week. Keep in mind that at 19 hours or 20, that's one class at a time, that is part time. When you have two classes at a time, that's 40 hours a week by anybody's stretch, that would be a full time job. That is full time. That is one reason why most students can't go full time and work full time. That's why a good chunk, like 85% or so of students, you know, usually go part-time. It's a very large number because, again, even if they try to go full-time at first, sometimes they just, they realize they can't handle that load as well. So it is, now you get some people who I'm convinced that they just don't sleep or something. You can. No word of a lie. The other senior director at AP had triplets and finished her doctoral program in three and a half years. And I'm sitting there going, and she already had one kid, and I'm like, what? How'd you handle that? I don't think I can get mine done. And even close to that amount of time, and I don't have any kids. And so there are some people you're just gonna be thoroughly amazed at, and they just can do whatever they can do. They're not the norm. In addition, people say, well, 20 hours a week is too much to do in one week. But remember, if you were doing semester courses, you'd be doing two at a time to meet part-time financial aid. And if you had one three-hour class in 15 weeks, that's about nine hours a week. So if you're taking two of them at the same time, that is about the same. So you're basically doing the same. You've just moved it to one set of concepts at a time. And students often like that. Because if you've ever tried to hand in two sets of assignments on the same weekend, it sucks. And so having only one of the classes at a time means you're only having to remember one set of readings, one set of assignments, those kinds of things. We had a uh, DMP program at one place where students did, a bunch of their Brown students moved online when we got the online program up and going. And their reason for it was not what I thought it was be when we asked them. I thought it was going to be like convenience, you could move from home, and campus, those kind of things. It wasn't that. They knew it was going to take them the same amount of time. They said, at least now I only have to read one set of things. Mm -hmm. Which, it's fine if these two things were related, you know? You're, you're taking stuff that's uh, conceptually, but if you're taking things that are wildly different, you know, uh, calculus and English literature, you know, you're, you're doing two sets of very different readings, two sets of, so having one at a time at that point can be very helpful. So. It is the same amount of work, or ideally it should be. It's just looking at your class and seeing whether or not there already is too much in there. Do you need to take any out? Do you need to put it in a different way? Do we need to streamline it different? Is it in somebody else's class? So just questions to ask. But then we look at how much time it should take you to do different things. So time on task refers to the amount of time students spend attending to school-related tasks. So again, this relates to cognitive load because this is the time you actually spend doing stuff, not finding stuff, that kind of thing, or like finding the assignment, it's actually doing the assignment. Why do you think it's important? That's 
Yeah. You got a lot of stuff to do. You got to figure out how to fit it in a seven week course, and you got to decide what's more important than something else, right? And that's going to be hard to do if you don't know how long it should take to do different things. It's very easy to overload a course when you don't think about time on task because you say, oh, this is awesome. I love this article. This is great. This reading is awesome. This video is excellent. We do it with the best of intentions. So don't get me wrong. I don't think anyone's sitting there saying, you know what? I'm going to overload you and you ain't going to remember nothing. I really do think that we're all sitting there going, this is wonderful. I love this. We love our concept. We love our topic. We want to give you everything. We just can't. All right, so then first thing you need to consider is your type of task or assignment. This is six pages, double-sided, so we didn't kill too many trees, um, of just different types of activities and tasks. So uh, have you heard people usually teach the way they were taught, at least at first? People assess the way they were assessed that people grade the way they were graded. Until, again, something comes along to change it. So I've worked with a lot of groups who just weren't aware of different other things they could do in that class. So they always did paper, PowerPoint, or quiz. And that was it. There were no other different types of assignments. That was it. But not everybody learns the same way. So if we know that no one, people don't always learn the same way, it also stands true that people also don't necessarily get be assessed exactly the same every single time. I'll give you an example. I did a, an art project with some of my nursing students in a class that was on con uh, complex communication and caring. And so I asked them to go out and find a very caring or uncaring situation they were either part of or witnessed. And then they had to do something artistic on it and they had to present that to the class and bring in some of the research and theory to explain why they thought that was caring or uncaring according to the literature. Well, let me tell you, people say to you they don't want to write another paper, but when you tell them to do something different, guess what they all want to do? Can I just write a paper? Because it's the comfortable option. Not the easy one, it's just the comfortable option. If you want people to do something different, take away the comfortable option because I guarantee you I would have had 90% of my class just write a paper. Because they all came and asked me and I said no. You need to do something different. I need you to think differently and uh, conceptualize this in a different way. At the end of the day, although most of them bugged me initially, they all actually ended up loving it. They said it to me in the classroom. They wrote it on my evaluations. And my family is still in the area where I was teaching and they still go up to my mother who works at a Costco and say how much they remember that class. Uh, I can guarantee you I don't remember some of the classes where they, you know, just did boring stuff. That was one where they actually really remembered it and it stuck with them. Uh, one student totally blew me away. She did a painting and it was of a very uncaring moment. So it was two nurses just changing a patient and, and talking over them. Yo, how was your day? You know, so the patient was very not there to them. And so she painted a picture and she had the patient sitting in a field and she had her knees pulled up to her chest like she was sort of scared and vulnerable. She was naked because she was vulnerable. She was faceless because nobody could see her. She had these reeds <coughs> swaying in the front because, again, she was being obscured. The hospital was off to the side with this dark cloud around it because it was very negative space. But there was a little light off to the side because the student recognized what was happening and swooped in and started talking to the patient, like the person. And then she brought in a theory, uh, a uh, Parse's presence theory, and you just got to be, be there with people, and I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, she's so got this. <laughs> she got a concept, and she presented it in a way that I wouldn't have gotten out of a paper. I guarantee you, I would not have seen that out of a paper. And it was also interesting because this was a student who I, quite frankly, wasn't sure if she was getting it. Where I wasn't sure whether or not she would be okay in the nursing world or not. She didn't write papers particularly well. But after that, I felt a lot more comfortable. I felt like she got at least some of the core of it. Versus one of my other students who, in a nursing class, said to me, I don't get it, why do I have to care? So you can get a lot out of people, push them different way, yeah, I know. 
push them in different ways, get different things out of them, get them thinking differently, and really get them to remember that information by picking a different kind of assignment. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should get rid of all of your papers, PowerPoints, and quizzes. If it's necessary, if that is the best way to evaluate someone, then that's what you do. But is there a different way you could do something? These are just some ideas so that if you are thinking you would like to do something a little different, that there are some different ways of doing it. And obviously, it takes different amounts of time to get different assignments done. So that's one reason why I like to put it in here, it's just to think about the different assignment types and how that's going to affect you, and how, how that relates, again, to that information processing. Are you going to remember this assignment more? Are you going to remember the take home from this assignment or not? Think of it as well, of, is this real? You know, in, in the assignment world, we're also going to be talking about some of these things, so we'll, we'll wait until then to get into any more depth. But the idea being, there are different ways you can do things, but those different ways also take time. So this one has different activities you can do in the classroom, but then also different assignments. Now, variables to consider when you are calculating time on task. One is page density. We've seen books that are really open dense, you know, double spaced. You've seen ones that are tiny. There's uh, pictures on them, how many words per page. Um, how big is the book, you know? A lot of my nursing ones were yay big versus my English one, which was yay big, you know? So, how much density? The text difficulty, so are there new concepts? I, uh, my previous workplace, we all sat down as the leadership and went through and actually de developed this whole big chart of what we considered with time on task. If it's this type of level, this is what it's gonna be. If it's this type of level, uh, we wanted consistency across the university, and I ended up uh, getting into a cordial but spirited uh, argument with a math instructor who said, math is the hardest thing you're ever going to do, and I said, no, it's pharmacology. And they said, I don't get it, why? And I said, because you're learning math and a new language. And so, you know, you, you can have differences of opinion, basically, in what you think is harder or less hard, but just consider concepts, page density, and then what are you getting them to review it for? Is it just for fun, for review, to understand it, or really engage with that information? Unfortunately, there is a lot less research on writing rates. A lot of the research that is out there actually does the it, it, the evaluation in a different way. Rather than figuring out how long it took you, it says how much did you write in two hours. So it's sort of it, it's the sort of a limiting factor as opposed to how long it actually took you. There's also a bit more out there on people with certain um, learning disabilities, but not a lot out there on just your average person. Uh, but again, you still want to think about page density, so spacing, number of words per page. I highly recommend that you go with words per page versus number of pages. Like when you're giving a student an assignment, go number of words versus number of pages. Anyone know why? Font. Font, yeah. yeah. People, Spacing. Will, Spacing. Yeah. Yeah. People will start putzing with that document like crazy. They will move the spacing between letters. They will move spacing between lines. They will change their font. They will do all sorts of crazy things. But if it's just a count of your numbers, they don't do that. And I don't want them wasting the two, three hours they go through to do that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's kind of nutty. Also, if you do the number of pages versus words, you're actually punishing people for using big words. Uh, because people who use big words will use less words. But in a page, then people will use little words. So uh, it's also good just to just to give the number. Also, a lot of the, the research and a lot of the other calculations I've seen all do it in words. They don't do it in pages. <coughs> so, uh, text genre, it will take you longer to write anything original. And I even mean if it's just me recounting an experience, it will still take me longer to write something about me than it will take for, me, for someone to write or just copy. So we also need to keep that in mind. Anything they write will take longer than just copying. Uh, but text genre, so is it reflective or narrative? Is it about me? Is it a story? That kind of thing. 
is it an argument? Do I have to make a point? And then research, do I have to bring in literature, etc.? Um, if there are drafts or revisions, rewrites, feedback on rewrites, uh, that's ultimately up to you, but again, that will affect timing. There's a couple of ways you can do these calculations. Unfortunately, I'm here to say there are not a lot of studies on this kind of thing, and most of the things that are out there are on just writing like essays, so there's not a whole lot on doing other things. So a couple of ways to look at it. Research, again, if you find a study, that's great. Or guess what? AP has faculty grants, so you could do a study on it, <laughs> and we could fund it. Experiential, you've taught this class before. It took students about this amount of time to do it. By proxy, so that it would take me this amount of time to do it, and then double or triple it is usually the average. Within understanding that if you do something really well, you might need to you know, quadruple it or something like that. My brother, no word of a lie, can sit there and flip pages, and he's read the book. And he can answer any question you have on that book. And I got very upset at him because I'm an academic and he's a mechanic. And I said, I wanted that skill. Why didn't it come to me? <laughs> um, but no word of a lie, because it could flip pages. So needless to say, I wouldn't take his by proxy of reading because everyone would be really behind them. Or survey. So ask students. Um, it can be something you ask them at the end of the course, that kind of thing. I frequently did this. Uh, early on when I was first teaching because I wanted to see how long did it take you to get these things done. I remember this one student going, oh my gosh, it was so hard. It took me so long. It was like 20 hours a week of work. Oh good, I was right on. <laughs> there are a couple of universities and places that have decided to go through and make some standards. This is a super cool um, website. Rice University, they actually have calculator. Now again, this is only going to do certain things. Uh, this has reading, writing, exams, and then basically if you do anything else, it's gonna fit into the other category. So then it's just a swag at that point. You know what a swag is? Scientific wild ass guess. So at that point, you're like swag. Yeah. I had one time where I said swagging uh, in a class because uh, the student had said, you know, if it's a cardiac issue, then that's usually higher up on the importance level. I'm like, yes, that is usually the case. If you're at the point where you're just swagging it, that's a better bet than a lot of things. And then later on in the class, somebody had asked me about uh, what are roofies because it was a farm class. And so at the end of the class, somebody said, I'm, I'm going to take home swag and roofies from this class. And I'm like, oh, wow, I hope you brought more than that home. <laughs> <laughs> so reading, and this is where I was saying uh, words density is down here, but this is uh, reading pages. Uh, but uh, so let's just say I had you know, 50 pages per week. We're going to say class is seven <coughs> weeks. Um, page density will go with 600. We'll say there's many new concepts, and I want them to understand it. Um, pages per semester, with the understanding that usually uh, 250 to 350 words is usually double spaced. That's that's your average per page. Um, so let's say I wanted them to write 10 pages. If it'll let me. Um, let's say it was argument, and I'm not taking a draft. Exams, so we have four, and a study hours per exam. <coughs> I want you to study five hours an exam. And then other assignments per semester, let's say again, I had like six, and I'm gonna put in a wild guess of five hours. And that's 13.3 hours out of work class a week. So and now I can start to go back and say, okay, Maybe you want to put something else in, maybe you want to do something else. Or you might end up coming in here and saying, okay, well, I want them to read 250 pages, and they're writing 45 pages, and they're doing seven exams, they're studying 10 hours a week, and they're doing uh, discussions and a couple of other things, so they're doing 15 other assignments, and they study for 10 hours, and now you're starting to realize that's probably not realistic. 
neat about this, they also have why they decided what they were deciding. So they have their reading rates, writing rates, a um, couple of the things. They also have a couple of, uh, again, articles and things like that. But again, you will find that some of these were unfortunately old. There hasn't been a whole lot more recently. And, uh, and even with the more recent stuff, when I was looking, uh, it's, it's limited as well in terms of its, its usefulness. Because like, again, if you tell me that you write this amount of, in two hours, that doesn't really quite help me calculate how long it should take you to write this paper as, as well. So that's, that's one of those. Um, Rochester has a less sort of concrete version. <coughs> There's just a little bit more about what should I do? How should I do it? You'll see here again, your three credit class stays at 135. It's just how many weeks. Um, they have a couple of different methods uh, that they recommend. And again, just looking at how long. It's, it's more of an encouragement. And then this is sort of some basics, like small group project meetings, take you an hour or so. Uh, this is something you could do long term as a group, as a faculty, come up with some consistencies. Uh, and again, these are, these are decent starting places. <coughs> All right, so any questions about time on task? So in the end, like I said, when we started, we want to consider cognitive loads. We want to help our students learn and retain information the best we possibly can. We want to make sure we stick within that a lot of time based on the credits, so the 135 hours or 20 hours a week if we have three credits. And then we want to make sure we evaluate all the different activities we're doing in a class so we can ensure that we aren't going too far over, too far under, and that we're really getting the most relevant information that we want to have in there 